cut versus thrust, the eternal debate of the perfect sword design. But today we're going to look at an original antique sword where one mad lad of a British officer decided to throw everything in one direction. Hi folks, Matt Eason here, Scholar Gladiator. Now, over the last decade, many, many years, I've been talking about swords and lots of other types of weapon. And often, actually, when you boil things down to the design of swords, it comes to this eternal struggle between cut and thrust. Because the object which is the ultimate cutter is often not going to be the ultimate thruster. The object which is often the ultimate thruster is not going to be the ultimate cutter. It's about compromise and therefore lots of sword designs struggle between how do we make something which functions really well for cutting but also really well for thrusting and are we going to throw more weight in one direction or the other. And most sword designs throughout history have tried to make this compromise work. This is a uh, Bronze Age leaf bladed sword. There are lots of other types of Bronze Age swords but most types of Bronze Age swords are cut and thrust designs. Some of them are more specialised to one of, the, one of those two, more to the cut or more to the thrust, but most of them are cut and thrust designs. This is also true if we go through most of the ancient world. Even if we look at designs which are more catered towards cutting, something like the Copis or the Falcata, they still have thrusting capacity. If we look at the Roman Gladius, some people wrongly describe this as a dedicated thrusting sword, but it's got a big old broad blade. This is a compromised cut and thrust design, same for the Roman Spartha. Same with Greek swords like the Xephos as well, clearly owes something to the earlier bronze leaf blades, and it is a compromised cut and thrust design with a good acute point, but still a leaf shaped design which which emphasizes the uh, abilities of the cut as well. So these are compromised cut and thrust designs. As we come into the Middle Ages, uh, certainly in the early medieval period, there seems to be slightly more preference to, given to the cut versus the thrust. But by the time we get into the high and late Middle Ages, we get these compromised cut and thrust designs uh, like this Type 15 here, whereby we've got a good amount of cutting capacity and of course, an acute point for thrusting. Yet, always, there were some types of swords, certain types of falchion, for example, and, and chopper. Uh, it doesn't matter where we look in the world, we could look uh, at Renaissance Europe, where we get certain types of blade which have thrown more emphasis onto the cut rather than the thrust. They don't have particularly acute points, but therefore have a broad blade that will give good cuts out towards the tip of the blade and a good cutters. We find the same thing in uh, China, for example, with certain types of Dao design and certain types of Jian. Some of them were a little bit more towards the thrust, some are more towards the cut. But fundamentally, most of these, the vast majority, probably 80-90% of swords from around the world, even, even swords, I'll just grab one from behind the camera, like the Shamshir, which have thrown a lot in the direction of the cut, still have acute and small points. Not always just for thrusting, although for thrusting as well. These can still thrust even though they've, by their curvature, thrown a lot in the direction of the, uh, of the cut. So most 80-90% of swords from across the world throughout history are compromised cut and thrust designs. Now, in the 19th century, this cut and thrust debate hit the newspapers because by this time you've got at the beginning of tabloid newspapers, you've got sword scandals. Yes, that was actually a thing in Britain in the 1880s. You've got, whether it's in Britain or whether it's in France or Italy or America, you've got people debating, actually debating, oh, well, you know, the correct sword for light cavalry is a curved cutting sword or the correct sword for an infantry officer is a straight thrusting sword. And they're literally now debating it in letters to the editor in newspapers, and I've covered these in previous videos, I'm sure I'll cover them in future videos as well. And so that we find uh, predominantly still most designs like the 1845 pattern blade here featured on a heavy cavalry um, officer's sword of the 1860s are compromised designs. They are a slightly curved, predominantly single-edged cut and thrust sword with a spear tip that is a thrusting sword. And some sword designs as I say, uh, even in this period, went more towards the cut or more towards the thrust, but the majority are somewhere there in the middle, they're cut and thrust designs. So where's this leading? Well, we find that as we get towards the end of the 19th century, so the late 1800s, particularly as we get into the 1890s, although it did start earlier than that, there are certain people who are starting to throw all of their eggs into one basket, 
And for the most part, as we get into this period, it is towards the thrust. Okay, so we start to see, certainly by the time you get into the 1890s and into the early 1900s, a lot of cavalry swords, so for horseback uh, use, are becoming dedicated thrusters. And a lot of swords for infantry officers are also becoming pretty dedicated thrusters, even if they maintain some ability to cut. So just for a second to make this a little bit less Anglo-centric, a little bit less British, here is a Prussian cuirassier's sword. Now this is a cut and thrust design, but it is dead straight. And while it has been server sharp and it does have uh, a cutting edge on it and you can cut with it, it is a spear pointed straight blade that really is intended primarily to be thrusted with. So this is a um, 1889 pattern. So this is a late 19th century model. And the Prussians, the French uh, led the way, I would say, in Europe. Uh, not really the Italians at this point, but the Prussians and the French led the way, and the Swedish as well to some extent, in thrusting designs. Now, I've talked about the British 1892 pattern blade, 1895 and 97 pattern hilts that culminated in the current sword. This is still the sword carried today uh, in parade and at those kind of, you know, like uh, Remembrance Sunday and all of those sorts of things, Trooping of the Colour. If you see an infantry officer, they almost always, uh, if they're following the regulations, carry, carry this model of sword. Okay, so this is more or less a dedicated thrusting sword. Now I say more or less because actually if we look at Massiello's uh, fencing manual that associates with the 1895 um, treaties that goes with this sword, there are cuts in there. And in fact, many of these for World War I and the Boer War were sharpened for about 18 inches of the blade up here. So um, kind of 30, 40 centimeters of the blade um, towards the tip. So technically you can cut with them, but they, you know, you can look at the blade shape, you can look at the blade cross section. This is never gonna be a great cutter. It's not gonna cut anything like uh, something like that, okay? So a Bronze Age sword thousands of years earlier will cut better than this, but this is a really good thrusting sword and has the point of balance fairly far down near the hand, and it is a good nimble sword and it's good at parrying. It's a good thing to defend yourself with against bayonets or another person with a sword, even if you're out in somewhere like the Boxer Rebellion in China <coughs> or the Sudan campaign in 1898. Um, doesn't matter if you're coming up against Dao or uh, Kaskara or Talwas um, and things like this, you know, big cutty swords. You can, this is a solid bar of steel. It's not particularly light. It actually weighs as much as earlier swords. So it's a good parrying device and it's really stiff and good at giving point or thrusting. So this is a fairly stiff and very pointy blade. Yes, you could cut someone with it across the head or across the knee and it will do an injury, but primarily it is that really sharp and acute tip, which is gonna go straight through someone's body, clothing or no clothing, and out the, out the back and hopefully kill them in short order. So it's a bit like a bayonet blade, okay? Very good for stabbing and a good handguard. Now, that's all being said. So this is a dedicated thrusting sword, but it's not that dedicated, is it? What do I mean by that? Well, if we actually go back earlier in history, we see even more dedicated thrusting swords. And most people at this point will be instantly thinking of the rapier. That's right, why is the rapier an even more dedicated thrusting sword than that British officer's sword? Well, a number of reasons. It's an even more slender blade. It's a longer blade. It has a point of balance closer to the hand. It has a bigger guard. It has a longer cross guard. So this in many, many ways is, can stab from further away. It has a more nimble, uh, and a tip that feels lighter, although the total weight of the weapon is actually about the same, it feels lighter at the tip. It's got a more responsive tip. So you can hit from further away, you can skewer someone from further away and keep yourself safer, which is quite good if you're fighting against people with something like a talwa or a dao, and they're trying to take your head off, but they've only got 30 inches of blade, you can skewer them from 40 inches away in the head or chest. Quite useful for defensive purposes. And it's got a nice big guard here with quillons that is more protective. One of the downsides of thrusting, while it's very good at killing people, uh, while you are thrusting, number one, when your blade is in their body, there's nothing much defending you except for your hilt, or if, assuming you don't have a dagger or a buckler or anything like this. Um, and secondly, you've got to get it back out again, okay? Whereas a cut will go in and naturally come out most of the time, a thrust will go in, you have to actually get it out before you can either thrust again or defend yourself. 
So having a good hilt with a thrusting sword quite important. Another type of dedicated thrusting sword doesn't have that protective hilt, but has a very, very light and responsive blade. It is the small sword, and the small sword really is a small and light and easier to wear version of the rapier. It's an evolution of the rapier. Comes about in about the 1660s, becomes really popular by 1700, and is the main dueling sword of the 1700s, uh, and was carried also by officers in, on, in the battlefield, as well as a pistol. And these were used in self-defense, in duels, and sometimes in war as well. Uh, so this is a very light, very nimble, very quick weapon, and it gives rise to modern foil fencing, essentially. The foil is the practice weapon of this. Um, so it is a scaled down rapier. So, coming back to the officer's sword. This, while it might be a great thruster and might be very solid at parrying things like bayonets or uh, tulwars or uh, dao or whatever, um, so it's good at parrying device and it's a good thrusting device, it isn't all that long um, and it doesn't have any kind of cross guard. Uh, so actually if we just focus on the length but also if we think about the responsiveness of the tip, one of the uh, one of the criticisms of this sword, and you could relate this also to the French comparison, the 1882, for example, which was the standard and still is the standard French infantry officer's sword. Um, it's not particularly nimble at the tip, and it doesn't reach very far. So now we get round to the weird, wacky, and I have to say, god awful ugly sword <laughs> that has come into my uh, possession, and this is an amazing thing. <laughs> Okay, so this is a British officer's sword, and it's not even Victorian, it's actually Edwardian, it's from the early years of, of uh, Edward's, um, Edward VII's reign. It dates to around 1904 to 1906. So we're dealing with only 10 years before World War I. Now, I've mentioned this many times in previous videos, but you've got to remember that we now look at World War I in hindsight. We now think about planes and tanks and artillery that shoots for miles and trenches and all of these things. We think about machine guns and the you know cavalry not being able to operate in the way that it was expected. But you've got to bear in mind that in the year 1904, at that time, Japan was at war with Russia. And a lot of that war was decided by bayonet charges. And a lot of Western doctrine, the British army, the French army, Austro-Hungarians, they were looking at that war in the East between the Russians and the Japanese, much like how we now look at wars that are going on in other parts of the world, and, and decide our military procurement and uh, tactics based on what's going on over there. And it's not always the best idea, because often that war is very different to the next war. They looked at that and they went, bayonet charges, yeah, there's going to be loads of hand-to-hand -hand combat. So in 1904 to 1906, the British, particularly because the British were on the Japanese side behind the scenes and they had uh, British officers were stationed out with the Japanese army observing, and they were seeing the Japanese kicking the Russians' butts with bayonet charges, Banzai bayonet charges. So they want, okay, this is the future. Clearly, you know, machine guns, combined operations, we're going to be using uh, cavalry as well. They hadn't yet invented tanks, of course. So we're going to be using highly mobile cavalry and our infantry are obviously going to be prized marksmen, but they're also going to be charging in with bayonets a lot because this is what they're doing in the um, Japanese-Russian war right now, okay? So that bearing in mind, British officers who are joining the army in 1904 come into this environment. They, the empire, the British empire is still out in India. Uh, the strength, very, you know, massively powerful, but there's problems on the Northwest frontier. The Afghans are a little bit of a problem. There's some problems in places like China, uh, down in Persia, um, North Africa, the Sudan, places like this. And swords, bayonets and lances are still being used in those places. So, don't think about the fact that 1904 and 1906 is not very long time ago. Think about the fact that a British officer, or this would go for French, Spanish, Portuguese, Dutch, Prussian, Italian, all of these other empire-wielding um, uh, powers at this time, the officers joining those forces might be going out to the colonies or they might be fighting a war in Europe and they're looking at the Japanese-Russian war and they're thinking swords and bayonets and lances are still going to be used. So what does this officer do? Does he go and get the standard old 1897 pattern sword? Oh no, he goes, I want to go, I was going to use a rude expression that I went, I want to go full hog, I want to go deep penetration, really, 
I don't just want a good thrusting sword. I want an ultimate, even better thrusting sword. I want a longer blade. I want greater penetration. I want a guard which works better for a thrusting sword than the saber guard here. And I also want a hilt that I can grip, not like a saber, but I can grip it more like one of those awesome old thrusting swords of days of yore, <laughs> ages past. So essentially, he wanted a rapier. Now you might think, why didn't the officer, why didn't the British officer just go and buy a rapier? Because there's regulations, sir. You have to observe the regulations. Your sword has to be in a regulation scabbard. From a distance, it needs to at least passingly look like a regulation sword. The guard needs to look a little bit like that. So what did this mad lad do? He went and got a rapier blade with a modified rapier hilt with a little bit of a regulation guard on it. Um, yeah, this thing is super ugly. I will completely accept that. However, it's also super cool. So let's have a little bit of a look at its features. The first thing to notice is it has a pommel, a knuckle bow, a cross guard and a rocasso. So this entire hilt is actually quite similar to a spadroon hilt, which in itself derives from a small sword hilt which in itself derives from a rapier hilt. The most important thing you need to know about this is it has a fairly long grip with a pommel at the end, but most importantly, it has a place to stick your finger. So when you grip this, you can hold it exactly like a rapier. And in fact, if we look at small swords, this is a particularly old small sword and old small swords do have functional fingerings, but late small swords, certainly most things that people would have been familiar with in the age of the officer's sword in the Edwardian period, actually had vestigial like leftover fingerings that you couldn't actually put your finger through. If we go back to earlier rapiers, they've got massive fingerings that you can fit one or sometimes two. A Spanish rapier you can often fit two fingers through. Okay, so that essentially fingerings got they got they grew bigger and then they grew smaller again. This guy hasn't gone for a finger ring exactly, but there is a space for to put your finger over the quill on, and I'm certain that's how it was intended to be held. The reason I know that is because of the rounded shape of this Ricasso block here. And by putting your finger over there, it means that you're very much gripping this like a rapier. Now, what would have been the period references for this British officer? They would have been either historical rapiers or possibly the Italian foil, because Italian foils at this time still maintained a finger ring and a ricasso, and they still put the finger over. So the Italian foil was a little bit more like a rapier, in fact, whereas the foils we're familiar with in modern Olympic fencing are French foils, and they don't have any of that gubbins. So is it possible this person had some Italian influence? Possibly. I wouldn't write that out. Um, however, we don't know. So, the hilt you can grip like a rapier. Now, let's look at this weird shell guard because da, 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 it is a section of an 1897 guard, even with the folded over section. Now, let's just grab the 1897 for comparison here. You can see the folded over edge, folded over edge. Look at the fronts of the guards. You can literally see where it's being cut out and the crown has been cut out there over the top of, uh, this one's actually a later, uh, oh no, that is actually Edward, that is complete chance. That is also Edward VII. So they're both Edward VII hilts and this one has been cut out. Now I fully, this was actually made, this sword for the real aficionados watching this, you might be wondering who made this sword. Uh, this was actually made by, oh, I should pull that, and I don't want to give too much away actually. No, I won't show you that yet. Uh, it was made by George Thurkel. So if you look on the Eastern Antique Arms website, so my antique dealing website, I have a section for research and I have articles there and I have a section on the Thurkel family. Now the Thurkel family were a famous sword making family from the middle to the end of the 19th century. Um, but George Thurkel was a, one of the sons who was still making swords as a separate entity in the early 1900s. And this is one of them. So this was a custom piece. And I fully suspect that George Thurkel took a standard guard and cut it down to, to order for the shape. But look at this nice little detail. This guy wanted a cross guard, so he put his finger across, but look, the cross guard protruded from the guard there. 
and so he's cut a nice little hole for it to come out of. It's so charming. It doesn't need to be there. He could have just made that guard, that cross guard shorter and ha kept that blocked up. But nope. Instead, he decided to go full hog. I wanted that to stick through there. It also makes it a little bit more stable, adds another anchoring point for the guard. And so he's cut that through there, which was something that's reminiscent of boat shell guards that we see on heavy cavalry dress swords. Do I think this is one of those? No, because that's an infantry officer's guard there. Uh, and this is silver or white metal finish plated. Uh, and if you were in the horse guards, the dress sword had to be gilt, had to be gold colored. So I don't think it's that. I think it is an infantry officer's sword. Finally, we get to the main custom. I mean, that's, well, I won't say the main custom feature actually, but from a functional point of view, this is pretty weird. Yeah. I mean, that's just so different to a typical sort of 1897 hilt or sabre hilt of the time. Okay. But this is, this is where it gets for me really funky. We have got a extra long 39 inch rapier blade. That's right. This is a double edged hollow ground mid ribbed and service sharpened, this ain't just a dress sword, rapier blade. And I just want you to feast your eyes on the glory that is this blade. Look at that hollow grinding. That is such a thick midrib. And this is about uh, nine millimeters thick. I haven't actually measured it, but it's about nine millimeters thick at the Ricasso. And it does distal taper down, but it stays pretty damn thick. And it has been service sharpened on both sides. Just look at that cross section on there. It is so, so hollow ground. By hollow ground, that means you start off with a rectangular section here and you literally use a round uh, grinding wheel to grind out that section. Uh, it could be forged as well. It can also be forged or rolled in a die. So there are various ways of doing it, but essentially you end up with this type of cross section that goes up to a ridge and then down. So it's scooped out, which means that this is light but also incredibly stiff because of course the cross-sectional thickness is really thick, uh, but it's just amazing. So this is really, really comparable blade to a period rapier. And you can see that they are comparable lengths. 39 inches is a good length for a 17th century rapier. So service sharpened, presumably intended for use, 39 inch long and you see it's still got its original mirror polish. It's been kept very well in the scabbard. Obviously the scabbard is uh, custom made for it uh, because it has to be very long and straight uh, and fit that section of blade. And an interesting detail again for the real aficionados is the end of the scabbard has a Scottish style ball end on it. I don't know if that necessarily means that this person had anything to do with the Scottish regiment. If they did, then why would they have the standard infantry officer's guard? I don't know. It might be that they were in a Scottish regiment, but we don't really know. Anyway, this hopefully has been an overview. I hope make you think a little bit about sword design. This isn't just specific to this specific sword, but I thought you'd love to see this thing. I should also mention if you're one of my uh, patrons on Patreon, you will have obviously seen this sword before because I showed it to you when I first got it. I haven't yet cleaned it up. This is as the sword came to me and actually it's still got cobwebs and some dust and stuff on it. So it needs a good clean up and it will, it will brighten up a little bit, uh, but I'm going to be very sympathetic to this because this is, as far as I know, an absolutely unique uh, sword. And I, while I, my specialism is uh, British non-regulation officer swords, I have never seen anything quite like this. Um, I do have a Wilkinson sword, which has some parallels with it, which I might show in a future video. Um, but this is just something else. Really, really wacky. And isn't it great? And a good reminder that even in the years 1904 to 1906, when this was made, People were, some people, maybe the crazy people, were still expecting to use their swords because, yeah, people had pistols, people had broom handle Mausers um, and various types of revolver. The Colt 1911 wasn't that far away. So they did have forms of semi automatic pistol and revolvers, but. The fact is swords and bayonets were still being used. If we look at the Japanese Russian war, yes, Russian officers had revolvers, but they also used their swords. The same for the Japanese. Um, and you know, in World War One, we know bayonets were extensively used um, and uh, swords for cavalry were still extensively used as well. So yet another reminder that not that long ago, swords were still very much considered weapons of war.
I hope you've enjoyed this video. Uh, any questions, any queries, any requests, obviously, as always, I hope to see you down in the comments section down below. Thanks a lot for watching. I have been Matt Easton, and I will continue to be. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.